Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Church Every Day and the Ravi Zacharias International Ministry, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Answering Doubts Conference. Uh, my name is Kevin Yee. I'm one of the pastors here, specifically of our youth department called Roots Ministry. Um, you'll notice people wearing our shirts, so proud of you guys for getting together to do that. Um, tonight, we're also joined by a live stream audience who have been patiently waiting for us to begin. So let's give them a hand for joining us. Um, we have no idea how many people yet, but we'll hear those numbers later. Um, just to kind of give you guys a quick little intro, our heart here for this conference is uh, not just to have are down to answered and clarified, but it's really for all of us, whether or not we profess faith in Jesus Christ, to understand that some of our best questions and our deepest questions are best answered in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, so that said, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker. His name is Cameron McAllister. He's a member of the speaking and writing team at RZIM. Um, he was actually born out on the mission field in Vienna, Austria. And he came to the States uh, in 1998 when his father, Stuart McAllister, started working with Ravi Zacharias. So we're talking about an RZIM generational kind of situation going on here. Um, his apologetic approach is animated by a focus on the intersection of scripture and great literature. So if you guys are readers out there, um, Cameron's right alongside of us. I'm a reader too, so we appreciate that. So that said, I'd like for all of us uh, to join together in welcoming our first speaker, Cameron McAllister. Thank you very much. Boy, it is great to be here. And as Pastor Kevin mentioned, I did grow up on the mission field in Vienna, Austria, so in Europe, so that would explain my pallid complexion, which stands out in stark contrast with all of you Californians here. But it's beautiful to be here. And also, he mentioned my father, Stuart McAllister. And I want to begin with a story about Stuart. But whenever I talk about my father, I always have to begin with a word of apology. My father is from Scotland. And he speaks like he's from Scotland. But if you hear me, you would have to conclude that you don't speak like you're from Scotland, Cameron. And so I apologize, he has this wonderful Scottish accent, and if you'd like, I could talk like that for you for the rest of the talk. Would you like that? Speak with a Scottish accent. You understand me? My father used to tell me a story when I was a young boy. This was when we, when we were on the mission field in Austria. And this was a story about a bad man. And it sort of ran in a series. Every night he would come to my room, and he would say, all right, son, I'm gonna tell you the story about the bad man. And I would get really excited. I loved to hear the story about the bad man. And so my dad would tell me about this man who was very physically strong, and he used that physical strength against others. He used it to hurt others when they crossed his will. He was a man who was a criminal. He was a man who was a dangerous person. He was the kind of man who, if you passed him on the street, you would want to avoid. This man hurt many people. And one night... As he sat down on the foot of my bed again to tell me about the bad man, he was bringing the story to a conclusion. And he said, son, this bad man who hurt many people, who was dangerous, who was a criminal, was me. And I looked at my father sitting on the end of my bed, this loving man who was responsible for raising me, who was a wonderful human being, and I could not reconcile in my head this man and the picture that his story conjured up of this criminal, of this dangerous human being. And this was my first tangible encounter with what we Christians call transformation. The person sitting with me, my father, was a different person from the one he had been describing. And it began turning the wheels in my mind. I was fascinated. I was so captivated by this. So today we're going to be talking about a question that is rather odd. It may have struck you as odd when you first saw it. Is Christianity beautiful? Well, that's a funny way of putting it, isn't it? A far more practical question might have been, is Christianity true? Right? 
Or we could get even more nitty gritty and down to earth and just say, does Christianity work? Or is Christianity good for society? Is Christianity beautiful? Why are we asking whether Christianity is beautiful or not? But beauty cuts deep. The question of beauty really involves the question of what it means to be fully human. Because as I hope will will become abundantly clear to us this evening as we progress, I want to show, I want us to see that what we supremely value, what we think is supremely beautiful, ultimately is a human being. And so to ask, is Christianity beautiful, is really to ask, why is humanity beautiful? Or what does it mean to be a person? Now, it's not too hard to establish that human beauty trumps all other beauty. On the scale of values, human beauty always wins out. Think about a glorious natural scene. Let's say you've always wanted to see the Grand Canyon. It's on your bucket list. You go to the Grand Canyon. But let me tell you, if you you are with somebody, somebody you love, and they collapse, You'll forsake the Grand Canyon in a second. You'll turn your back on all that glory and all of your attention is focused right here on this human being. Even if a total stranger collapses, if you're a well-adjusted, caring person, your attention is going to be diverted to this human being. And all the glory, the Grand Canyon, whether it's an amazing, stunning sunset, whatever the site is, goes unnoticed by you, and you turn your attention to what matters most. If you find yourself in the exceedingly unlikely scenario of having to either rescue a great work of art or a person, I should greatly hope you'll choose the person. A man who rescues a painting over a person is not a great connoisseur of art. That person's a monster. We would save anybody, no matter who they are, no matter what their circumstances, over a great work of art. And speaking of works of art, have you noticed that their value, when it comes to the beauty of works of art, we often bring art into this discussion, the value of something, a work of art, is usually established when there is a tangible connection between it and the person responsible for the work. For years, there was a painting that went unnoticed in a remote Austrian monastery. This was a painting depicting the slaughter of the innocents. It was kind of a curious, odd little piece, and it was sort of relegated to a back hallway full of shadows, a dark corridor, until rumors of this painting started to circulate and get out, and until some pictures got out, and an expert traveled to this monastery, had a look at this painting, and identified it as a genuine Rubens by one of the Flemish master painters. The painting was then sold at an auction for $76.7 million. And the reason that value was established was because it was connected to the person responsible for the painting itself. It's the person who establishes the value. Think about human beings. We sell paintings at an auction, and they will fetch prices of upwards of $77 million, but have we ever, do we sell people on auctions? Do we commodify human beings? Sadly, this is a sad historical reality, and it's a sad fact today, and slavery we recognize rightfully as a grave evil, and we oppose it. Why? Because we recognize that you don't commodify a human being. There is no price that you put on a person's head, no matter who they are. And anything, any practice that takes a person from their status as a human being and objectifies them needs to be opposed because human beings are of ultimate value and worth. Human beauty trumps all other beauty. So when we're talking about beauty, we need to really talk about what Christianity brings to bear on this question of what it means to be human and what the fully human looks like. 
So one of the first features I want to draw your attention to is that we value purity in human beings. Now this might sound a little counterintuitive. This is certainly not the narrative that we often see painted in popular culture or in our major publications, but I think it's true. And I think with a little examination, we'll find it to be true. By way of example, I want to ask you to ask yourselves why we value diamonds. Why is a diamond valuable? You know, diamonds are very remarkable gems. We're told that they form about 100 miles below the Earth's surface under conditions of tremendous pressure and tremendous heat. And they're forced by volcanic eruptions to the surface of the Earth. Now, on that upward journey, their speed has to be so incredibly precise. If it's too, if it's too fast, too slow, the diamond will turn to graphite on its way to the Earth's surface. And as it's on this upward journey, it gets locked in place. The form is locked. And what emerges on the Earth's surface is a diamond encased in volcanic material. And then it is then harvested by somebody who is mining from that volcanic material. So in other words, all that to say, diamonds are rare. Diamonds are valuable. Diamonds are precious. But how is the value of a diamond established? Well, in a word, purity. We value the purity, the authenticity of a diamond. And the Gemological Institute of America, the GIA, have established the famous four C's. Color, clarity, cut, carrot. Well, they cheat with carrot because carrot is actually with a K, but, you know, this is branding purposes. So four C's, we'll go with carrot, with a C. Color. The title color is actually misleading because a diamond is flawless when it is as close to being colorless as is possible. Ideally speaking, a diamond should be as clear, as crystal clear, as a pure drop of water. Because diamonds are all about transmitting light. We want them to sparkle, we want them to shine, we want them to be luminous. We want them as close to colorless as possible. And clarity. So, when the diamond is on its arduous journey to the Earth's surface, it picks up these little things that jewelers call inclusions. You don't want inclusions. These are things you don't want included with your diamond, because an inclusion is a euphemism for a flaw. The flaws are often so deep-seated that they can't be seen by the naked eye. They can only be seen under intense magnification. But the less flaws, the more clear, the more pure, the diamond, the cut, the cut is my favorite. I love cut. We tend to think that the cut has to do with the shape, whether we're talking about a pear-shaped diamond or an emerald-shaped diamond, but actually it has to do with the way the stone interacts with light. The better cut the diamond is, the more it will reflect, the more it will shine, the more luminous it will be, the better it will interact with light. This is what we want diamonds to do. Sparkle, shine, twinkle, you name it. And the cut affects that. And finally, we come to carrot, and this just refers to the size of the diamond. And the greater the size, granted all three of these other C's are in place, the greater the value of the diamond. Purity. The four C's come together, and they show us a vision of purity. For a diamond to live up what, to the expectations we have of diamonds, to embody diamond-ness. You know, we do the same thing with human beings. We tend to value people who are pure people who say what they mean, people who are transparent, people who are honest, people who are authentic, people who are good. Purity. We call people who devote their lives to others and to improving the lives of other human beings humanitarians. And likewise, conversely, we call those who try to hurt other people or devote their lives to repressing others inhumane or inhuman. Inhuman is a very interesting word because it seems to suggest an absolute standard or a standard of personhood that has been gravely abandoned. Think about obituaries. Think about when we are remembering somebody who has passed on. When it comes to our reflections on somebody we've loved or somebody who's cherished, we don't tend to remember superficial beauty so much, do we? We tend to remember kindness, selfless acts. If I die, 
I hope at my funeral, and I will die one day, but if I die really soon, I hope somebody doesn't go up there and say, well, that Cameron, I'll always remember him for his great teeth. I'll remember him for his impeccable hair. I do have great hair, don't I? <laughs> no, we tend to remember people by their actions, the lives they lived, and the way they devoted those lives to other people. And this is where Christianity comes in. What I want to suggest to you, suggest to you tonight is that Christianity is an invitation to full personhood. It's an invitation to truly become a pure example of what it means to be fully human. And when we see somebody who embodies this kind of purity, this kind of selflessness, who devotes themselves to others and to the needs of others and to loving others and to putting the interests of others before themselves, it's extraordinarily beautiful. A person like Mother Teresa of Calcutta is not Scarlett Johansson. She's not Marilyn Monroe. She's not Christina Hendricks. She's not any kind of picture of conventional beauty that you can think of. And yet, we look at her life, and we, most people conclude she is an extraordinarily beautiful human being. Why? Because she selflessly devoted herself, herself to the need of others. She devoted her life to helping the poorest of the poor on the streets of Calcutta, giving them a place to, if they needed to die, to die with dignity, to nursing them back to health. You know what she said? She said one of the gravest illnesses, one of the gravest illnesses that desperately needs a cure is not leprosy, it's not any of the major sicknesses that she dealt with, it's the feeling of being unwanted, outcast, like nobody cares about you. And that's what she set out to do, to affirm these people, to not only cure them physically, but to restore to them a vision of who they are as a valuable human being. She had such an impression on so many people. The words of Malcolm Muggeridge are really fascinating in this respect. Malcolm Muggeridge was a journalist, a brilliant writer, experienced much success in his life, lived quite wildly for many years, really tasted of this life, went through the spectrum of human experiences and found all of them wanting, saw much of what we regard as beautiful. And yet, when he came into contact with Mother Teresa, he saw something he couldn't explain, something that was irreducible. He says this, he, after meeting her and after walking away from one of his meetings with Mother Teresa in person, he says, when the train began to move, and I walked away, I felt as though I were leaving behind me all the beauty and all the joy in the universe. Something of God's universal love has rubbed off on Mother Teresa, giving her homely features a noticeable luminosity, a shining quality, you might say, like a diamond. She has lived so closely with her Lord that the same enchantment clings about her that sent crowds chasing after Jesus in Jerusalem and Galilee and made his mere presence seem a harbinger of healing. You know, true Christians are just like pure diamonds. How come you never saw this before? Isn't it obvious? The four C's apply to true Christians. Colorless, pure as a drop of water, unclouded by ulterior motives, by an agenda, by dishonesty. Pure. James 5.12 tells us, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be straightforward, be clear, be pure, be focused. No salesmanship, no gimmicks. Transparent, honest, and clarity. None of us are without our faults. No Christian is out without his or her faults. But by God's grace, they work to push past those inclusions, past the sin that is accumulated in their life, to serve others in a way that they could not serve them on their own without Christ's aid. And because of that, an unmatched clarity begins to come into focus. Sin is a word we hate. We tend to prefer words like broken, Broken's a very popular word now, brokenness. 
But sin, another very helpful way to look at sin is as distraction. Sin takes your focus off what you need to be seeing. Think of an addict. An addict is a person who is profoundly out of touch with reality, is so distracted to the point of neglecting everything, even his or her own life. Sin does that same thing to us. 1 John 3.3 says that everyone who has their hope fixed on Christ purifies themselves just as he is pure. Clarity. Cut. And again, cut is my favorite. You know what diamonds don't do? Diamonds do not produce light. They interact with light. And Christians don't produce light in and of themselves. They interact with light, with the light of Christ. 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message we have heard from Christ that announced to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Pure, unadulterated light. This is what Christians, true Christians, interact with. This is what true Christians reflect, and it's extraordinarily beautiful. And carrot. Here we come to an item that might seem like a bit of a stretch. The carrot. Size. What does this have to do with true Christianity? Everything. Because with God's help, Christianity, true Christianity, issues in a power to do good That is impossible on human terms alone. A writer I like, Friar Thomas Dubay, says, A virtue is a power to be and to act, to live a gospel goodness such as love, patience, chastity, honesty, affability, magnanimity, justice, and humility. Virtues liberate us to be fully human. Virtues liberate us to be fully human. Have you ever thought of a virtue as a power? Have you ever thought of it as empowering to do good, to put others before yourself, to die to self, to love your neighbor as yourself? This is not weakness. This is not being a pushover. This is a tremendous power that comes from on high and liberates us to become more fully human and to make the world a better place and to allow our lives to reflect Christ in a way that is irreducible and so compelling. Well, I've given you an outline of a good person. I've given you a small outline of purity and why we value selflessness. But oftentimes we tend to think of this kind of behavior and we tend to think that people who are pure, people who are innocent, people who are good, don't really understand reality or understand the way the world truly works. That they are profoundly out of touch with reality, maybe naive, maybe evading or hiding from reality. So is that what Christianity is all about? Is it an evasion from reality? Is this just a beautiful evasion? Was Mother Teresa profoundly out of touch with reality and kidding herself on? Did she devote her life to a delusion? There's a very, very interesting verse in John chapter 17. And I want to have a look at it real quickly. There's some fascinating statements here. And they're so out of keeping with all of our common assumptions about the way somebody knows the truth. But Jesus, praying out loud for the sake of his disciples, says, Sanctify them in the truth. God, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves may be sanctified in truth. He's equating sanctity, he's equating purity, he's equating goodness with seeing the world as it really is. That's very curious. You see, Mother Teresa was not profoundly out of touch with reality. Those who serve the needy are not profoundly out of touch with reality. There is nothing more gritty, more down to earth, than devoting your life to the needs of others, to getting onto the street, to helping the poor, to helping those who desperately need to feel wanted and to need to feel loved. This is not an evasion from reality. This is a face-to-face confrontation with reality and the needs of the world. 
And Christianity, true Christianity, the truth of it, the sanctified life liberates you to see the needs in the world and to see the world as it truly is. Peter Kreef says this. He says, saints are not freaks or exceptions. They're the standard operating model for human beings. What's a saint? First of all, a saint is one who knows he is a sinner. A saint knows all the the news, both the bad news of sin and the good news of salvation. A saint is a true scientist, a true philosopher. A saint knows the truth. A saint is a seer, one who sees what's there. A saint embraces heroic suffering out of heroic love. A saint also embraces heroic joy. Heroic joy, I love that. How would you like to be known? That's something to be known for. Somebody who displayed heroic joy. Joy that couldn't be destroyed no matter what the circumstances. You know what joy is? Joy is a pervading sense that ultimately God will make everything all right. All shall be made well. All things shall be made new. And because of that, no matter what the circumstances, you can rest in that truth. Heroic joy. One of the most conspicuous facts, I think, about men and women who have devoted their lives to Christ completely, who have given themselves over to His leadership and made Him Lord of their lives, is a fundamental lack of distraction, a heroic level of focus. To be able to focus on the need around them, to focus on a hurting world, to train their eyes to see things as they actually are, and to be un distracted by so much of what usually tries to clamor for our attention in the culture. This is the unmatched focus of somebody who has sanctified themselves for the sake of truth. So Christianity is an invitation to true purity and goodness. It's an invitation to know the truth, to see things as they actually are, and it's an invitation to the beautiful the good, the true, and the beautiful. Now we come to the beautiful at long last. It's Christ, I want to suggest to you today, who is supremely beautiful and who gives us a vision of what is supremely beautiful. There's a wonderful quote from Yaroslav Pelikan. He says, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible with some sort of super magnet to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? Ladies and gentlemen, let me suggest to you today that in the entire history of the human race, there has only ever been one truly authentic human being, one person who really, truly lives up to our ideal of personhood, who brings the true, the good, and the beautiful together and consummates them in his very being. And his name is Jesus Christ. So often, much of this may sound odd, much of this may sound out of keeping with what we think of beauty. It may defy some of our conventional categories of what is beautiful. But that's because I think many of our categories are backwards. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once quipped and once griped that when he looked around at the sea of humanity, he said, we are human all too human. But it's Jesus Christ who emphatically reminds us with his life, with his words, with the cross, that the problem is not that we are human all too human. The problem is that we are not human enough. The problem is that this world operates with a tragically narrow understanding of what it means to be a person. Nietzsche understood this. And Nietzsche is one of the most consistent atheists out there. He was a brilliant human being. He was a brilliant man. And he grasped 
the price of rejecting Christianity. He looked at Christianity and he said, here is a belief system that profoundly devalues life. It's weak. It's resentful. It's not life-affirming. It's life-hating, laying down your life for others, putting the interests of others before your own. This is not strength. This is weakness, said Nietzsche. He grasped that all of the values, most of the values upon which Western culture is built, trace their lineage to this man, Jesus Christ, and to his work on the cross of Calvary. And he tried to reject it. And his last project, as his life drew to a tragic close, was to try to rewrite all the values of Western culture. And you know what he concluded? He concluded that in the end, when you strip it all away, all we are left with is what he called the will to power. This was Nietzsche's vision of the good life. To assert your will, to assert your power, to dominate the lives of others. And he made a very compelling case for this. And he made it in very poetic and lyrical and inspiring and moving passages that really resonate, especially with young adolescent boys. It did with me for a while. But ask yourself this question. Is that the world you want to live, live in? Does that line up with reality? Do you want to live in a world ruled by men and women who are dedicated to the philosophy of the will to power and domination? Or would you rather live in a world where the dominant value is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself? If everybody, if, if just all of the Christians in this world lived out these two commandments to the utmost of their abilities, not perfectly, but to the utmost of their abilities, this world would be a profoundly different place. It would be turned upside down for all the right reasons. By and large, it would be a world where you could leave your doors unlocked, where you could trust people. Which of these visions of reality truly lines up with the way the world is, the way human beings are designed? Human beings are not empty, secular creatures. Some of our greatest, most incisive minds right now, currently writing, recognize this. Some of you know, may be familiar with the writer David Foster Wallace. He was a brilliant man. In many ways, an intellectual hero of mine. He was a prodigy. He was equal parts poet and philosopher. He even had tremendous athletic skills, which just makes me hate him even more. But he had an amazing skill set. He had all the accolades and all the affirmation a person could ever want. He was the recipient of a MacArthur grant, the Genius Grant. And he made a very famous commencement address to the 2005 graduates of Kenyon College. And you know what he said in that commencement speech? It's very interesting. Bear in mind that this is a man who never signed off on any faith statement, who never claimed to be a part of any church, never claimed to be a Christian, but in that commencement address to these bright young graduates, and by extension to us, he says that the most important question to ask ourselves is what will I worship? He made a lot of his fans very angry by saying this, and then he went on to say, he got even more explicit, he said, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice you get is what to worship. We're naturally worshiping creatures. The important question to ask ourselves is, what am I worshiping and can this thing save me? I bring up David Foster Wallace, and now I have to bring in some of the tragic details of his life, because they're unavoidable here, and they add a whole new level of gravity to what he said. In 2008, David Foster Wallace took his own life, three years after he made this speech. 
And the question to ask ourselves is, what can save us? What can save you and what can save me from death? Can our money save us? Can our beauty save us? Can our talents save us? Can power save you ultimately from going to the grave? What can save you? The pattern of selflessness is so compelling to us. Lives set apart for others shine with such a beauty to us because of one man named Jesus Christ. Because he willingly laid down his life for others. The incarnation is one of the greatest mysteries and one of the greatest facts in human history. The fact that Jesus, that the God of creation, the one who brought everything into being, the unconditioned source of all that is, took on flesh and walked as one of us, in our shoes, so to speak. The playwright has entered into the drama of human history to show us what it means to be human, to show us how to truly live. He knows. He designed you. He designed me. He knows the way we're ultimately supposed to work. And his offer to you is life. His offer to you is to save you from death. You know, John 8.51 says that those who listen to Jesus and do what he says shall never see death. It's astonishing words. Very bold. Radical. But this is the offer from Christ. If you choose to follow him, to become his apprentice, to do and learn and to live and act the way he lived, you can take hold of eternal life. Not tomorrow, not after you die, but now. Christ came to bring a message. He came to tell about the kingdom of God. You know what the kingdom of God is? Dallas Willard says the kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will in the world. It's the place where what God wants done gets done. And it looks a lot like what we see when we see a Mother Teresa of Calcutta taking in the destitute and those who feel unwanted and those who are outcast and helping restore to them an understanding of who they are, children of the living God, created in his own image. It is Christ who confers on human beings their value. I want to look at Philippians 2, 3 through 7, because this really solidifies this. Theme of selflessness and this theme of giving, this self-giving theme that, we've been, that I've been hammering on for so long tonight. Starting in verse 2, it says, Make my joy be complete. I'm sorry, starting in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. What an astonishing reality that God came down, was made in the likeness of men that he might save us. Recall that illustration I gave you earlier about a painting in an Austrian monastery relegated to a shadow, in a back hallway full of shadows until somebody recognized who was responsible for this painting, until somebody recognized a tangible connection between the painting and the great artist. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross 
establishes your value and your worth as a human being. It is the signature piece that ties you to the great artist because the God of all creation considered you so valuable, so worthwhile that he laid down his life for you. This is the price that was paid for you. And this is the tangible connection between the person and the ultimate person of Jesus Christ. And this establishes your value. And that this means that there is no one, no one, regardless of who they are, their social standing, their disabilities, who is not of powerful and priceless value. This establishes human dignity, human beauty. It's on the basis of Christ. All of our categories of beauty come from Jesus, ultimately, because Jesus is the ultimate expression of the beautiful. And if you doubt that, if you think about our great works of art, and think about the central preoccupation, it's always commemorating some aspect of what it means to be a person, of what it feels like to be a human being. My own area of focus and interest tends to be literature. Why do we continue to read a story like Charlotte's Web? Because we want to reflect on what it feels like to be a spider or a pig? Why do we read The Wind and the Willows to our children? Because we want to reflect on what it feels like to be a mole, a rat? No. Regardless of the costume, these stories are always about human beings. And they always commemorate an aspect of humanness. Franz Kafka wrote a famous story called The Metamorphosis about a man who wakes up and is a giant insect. What could be less human, less familiar, than a story about a man who wakes up as a giant bug? And yet, many are agreed, many have said that this is Kafka at his most autobiographical, that this is a reflection, this sheds light on his life and his own relationship with his father, because we read this story and we get a feeling of alienation, loneliness, and isolation. We can't get away from our obsession with the human and what it means to be human. And when we see somebody whose life reflects a more full picture of what a human being can do, it's extraordinarily beautiful. A life set apart for others, a life set apart for Christ. Paul tells us in Romans to put on Christ. And it's extraordinarily beautiful because Christ embodies what it means to be human. And this is the vision I want to leave you with this evening. This is the encouragement I want to leave you with this evening, the gentle nudge. We look at a person like Mother Teresa of Calcutta. We look at a person like Jesus of Nazareth. We look at those who have selflessly devoted their lives to others, and we're astonished, and we're amazed, and we say, this is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. This is not the normal case. This is not a normal human being, right? Because people don't normally live lives like this. But I am going to humbly suggest to you this evening that we have a very skewed and distorted view of what constitutes normal. Just turn on the six o'clock news. Planes shot out of the sky, turmoil, upheaval, unrest, famine, war, plagues, Normal, what passes as normal in our world is horrifying and reprehensible. We are called to a new normal. Christ started a world revolution that continues to this day, and his invitation is to take hold of full personhood, to become, in fact, a new person. We say when you come and devote your life to Christ that you are, what? Reborn. Very intentional language. To become a new creature. To become a foretaste of heaven for a world in desperate need of hope. Clamoring for healing. Because Christ is coming back one day. 
And He's coming to usher in a new heavens and a new earth to remake everything, to put all right, to make all things new. And in that world, the new normal will look a little bit more like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, like a life, like the life of Christ, devoted completely to God and to others. It's an amazing vision. And the invitation is to come into that reality now where you are. And it's my prayer for you that if you're wrestling with this, if you're confused, if you're hurt, if you have felt let down by others, if you've felt let down by yourself, and if you've come to the conclusion that whatever it is you're searching for, you're not it, because you look at all the failures in your, your own life, and if you come to the conclusion that other people can't be it because they've failed you, they've stabbed you in the back, they've hurt you, my hope is that you will look to Christ. Call out to Him. Ask Him to reveal Himself to you. Search Him out. Look at His life. The question before us this evening is, is Christianity beautiful? But the question truly is, is Christ beautiful? This is what I want you to turn over in your minds and wrestle with. When you look at Christ, look at His words, look at His actions, look at the pattern of His life, and look at what He established, the precedent He set. Ask yourself, is Jesus beautiful? Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for who You are. Lord, I thank You that You make it possible for us to be fully human. Lord, I thank You for Your work on the cross, for redeeming us, for making it possible to take hold of eternal life now. And Lord, I don't know what's going through the hearts and minds of all of those who are here in this room, all of those who are listening online. Many people may be angered by some of the things I've said. Many people may be confused. Lord, I pray that if there's anything erroneous I've said, it would drop to the ground unheeded. But Lord, if there are honest questions, if there's a real stirring in people's hearts, God, I pray that you would draw that out and grant us the courage to come face to face with these issues, to ask ourselves, what is truly beautiful? Because beauty gets to the heart of so much of what makes life meaningful to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would become a supreme reality to all of us, Lord. It's in your son's holy name I pray. Amen.